All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to MOS Live. You're here for our uh, Museum of Science live program all about Massachusetts dinosaurs with a special guest scientist today. My name is Becca, my pronouns are she and her, and today I'm super excited to be your moderator. What that means is I'm going to be fielding any questions that come in on Zoom and sharing them with our guest scientists today. If you have a question and you would like to ask it, uh, you can type it into the Q&A box on Zoom. Feel free to include your name and age if you would like a shout out if we end up taking your question. If you're on Zoom and would like closed captions, you can click on the closed caption button and click show subtitles. And finally, if you're joining us on Facebook and YouTube today, we are incredibly excited that you're joining us. However, please note that we will not be able to see any of your questions or comments during the actual live broadcast, but we do hope that you join in on the fun and enjoy. So with that, I think it's time that I invite our guest to come onto the screen and introduce themselves. Hello, I'm very happy to join Ask a Scientist today. My name is Mark McMenamin and I teach geology and paleontology at Mount Holyoke College here in South Hadley, Massachusetts. So welcome everyone for coming and I'm looking forward to your questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Mark. I'm very excited to have you here today. And I know lots of people are excited and have a lot of questions that are already starting to come in. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why we're kind of talking about Massachusetts dinosaurs today is because that we had a vote very recently for a Massachusetts state dinosaur, and it was between two different dinosaurs. Would you mind telling us a little bit about the two dinosaurs? Oh, I'd be glad to. Yes, there are two dinosaurs known to occur in the, the early Jurassic strata of Massachusetts. And these include Podocosaurus holiocensis and Ankosaurus polyzelis. And these were the two candidates in the election. And uh, uh, Podocosaurus won the election. Podocosaurus is a small carnivore. Ankosaurus is a larger herbivorous dinosaur. So um, these are the two dinosaurs we know of from skeletal material here in Massachusetts, but I'm certain there were others also. We have to do more digging. Awesome, well, excited about that and definitely mm -hmm. excited about Podocosaurus holiocensis. Now I know there's a pretty cool story about uh, Podocosaurus and uh, someone who found it. So I wonder if we could go into that a little bit. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, the Podocosaurus specimen was found by my predecessor here at Mount Holyoke College, whose name was Mignon Talbot. And uh, Professor Talbot uh, was a very um, well-known uh, woman paleontologist. Uh, she was here at the college from 1904 to 1935. And in 1910, while here in South Hadley, the same town that holds the college, she stumbled upon a, a, a partially complete skeleton of a new dinosaur no one had ever seen before. That's awesome. I mean, imagine that. That would be so cool to be able to see a fossil of a dinosaur that we didn't know about. She was walking with her friend Ellen, and the first thing that she said was, oh, Ellen, come here. I found a real live fossil. That's so fun. I would I would have enjoyed that. That's certainly one of my my dreams here. Uh, now, we're getting a few questions coming in so far. Um, and yes, one I've really. Yeah, and one interesting one, uh, Sophia, age nine, is wondering, what is your job like as a paleontologist? Oh, uh, that's a, a great question, uh, Sophia. What I do as a paleontologist is that um, I sometimes travel. I'm searching for fossils in, in America or in other countries. And I've traveled to uh, Mexico, Sweden, um, uh, Namibia in Southwest Africa and other places searching for different types of fossils that we need to know more about. And also I spend a lot of time studying the fossils in the laboratory and um, looking at them under the microscope, looking at them under the scanning electron microscope, making digital scans and photographs of them. And uh, also I, I teach my students here at Mount Holyoke about geology and paleontology, oftentimes featuring the uh, fossils that I've helped discover. 
That is awesome. I definitely enjoy that as a fellow geologist myself. Uh, and now I know a really interesting question that comes up a lot um, is kind of about what you were mentioning about Massachusetts dinosaurs and fossils in general. So why are skeleton of dinosaurs so rare in Massachusetts? And the uh, skeletons of dinosaurs are thought to be rare in Massachusetts. Um, however, um, I think we need to revise that standard statement, which has kind of been dogma for many years in Massachusetts geology. Uh, it's turning out um, that um, there probably are a lot more dinosaur skeletons here in Massachusetts than we, we thought before. Part of the reason we don't know much about them is because the glaciers have left a lot of glacial till that covers the bedrock exposures where our dinosaurs are. But the dinosaurs are here. Their skeletons are here. They're in the ground. And we just have to become a little more um, energetic about finding them and getting them out the ground. Uh, we're falling behind our Chinese colleagues who do much more digging than we do. And their rocks are no more fossiliferous than our rocks are. We just have to do more digging here in Massachusetts and in, in the United States. Awesome. So you're saying that maybe we will find more dinosaur uh, species and fossil skeletons in Massachusetts. I know we will. Yes. <laughs> I like that. I like that. The confidence. Awesome. All mm -hmm. right. Well, we are uh, definitely getting quite a few questions coming in. Uh, and one of the interesting ones kind of going along the lines of where you would find dinosaurs mm -hmm. is a question here uh, wondering if maybe are any dinosaurs found in both Massachusetts and Morocco specifically, but also maybe are there dinosaurs that are found in multiple different places around the world? Um, now, dinosaurs are very widespread. You find their fossils on every continent. And early in dinosaur history, in the uh, uh, late Triassic and early Jurassic, um, the dinosaurs were living on a supercontinent called Pangaea. And so dinosaurs were literally able to walk from one end of the dry land earth to the other. It was technically possible to walk from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego all the way to Antarctica and the dinosaurs did that. So there was a lot of um, common types of dinosaurs that were um, widespread throughout the whole world. Now, um, in spite of this, and the dinosaur fossil record is not always as good as we would like it to be. So I think there probably were dinosaurs in common in the early Jurassic between um, Massachusetts and Morocco, let us say, but that we need to know more about the dinosaurs in both places before we can really understand what, what we would call the paleobiogeographic connections. So it's possible that Podocosaurus lived in Morocco, but we just don't know. And it's possible that a Moroccan dinosaur lived in Massachusetts, but we just don't know. We have to find those bones and I'm working on that right now, getting us mo more bone material. That's awesome. I'm definitely looking forward to finding out what, what kind of results that brings. Uh, so we have a, a good question here. I've always heard personally that Coelophysis may have been around New England. And mm. Esme, age eight, is wondering, how can someone prove that Podocosaurus is different from a Coelophysis? Ah, that's a, that's a great question. Now, um, Coelophysis and Podocosaurus were both small carnivorous dinosaurs. They may have been the ancestors of the larger carnivorous dinosaurs that came later like the Allosaurus in the late Jurassic or the Tyrannosaurids of the Cretaceous. So um, how would you tell a Coelophysis and a Podocosaurus apart? Well, that would be based on their skeletal structure, um, particularly their hip structure. So um, you would look closely at the hip bones, the ischium, the pubis, the ilium, and also at the uh, bones of the, um, the spinal column and the vertebral centra and the neural spines can give you some clues. The limb st structure can also show you that there are differences between the dinosaurs. And of great importance would be the skull and making comparisons between the skulls of the dinosaurs. Unfortunately, we have not yet found the skull of Podocosaurus. 
So we can't make a direct comparison between the head of Podocosaurus and the head of C. lephysis. Hopefully that will change soon. Again, one of those things that I'm excited to hear the results about. <laughs> yes, we have some very exciting results that will be published later this year. So uh, stay tuned. Awesome. Uh, and here we have a question from Dan, age 19. Mm -hmm. Could you describe what the environment, climate, biome of Massachusetts would have been like during the life of Podocosaurus? Uh, maybe what were the apex predators, marine life, etc.? cetera? Oh, that's, that's a fabulous question. Okay, we're, we're dealing with a, a part of the world that has a very continental climate, uh, in a sense. Um, there, there's, um, we're still in the times of um, the supercontinent Pangaea. It's just begun to bro break up. Um, there are new oceans opening up, but still you have a pretty um, uh, supercontinent-like climate which is a kind of a rough climate. It can be very dry. There can be monsoonal rains. And where Podocosaurus was living, um, there were um, a, a lakes that were developing in lowland areas that were formed by um, the collapse of parts of the supercontinent as it was pulling apart. So these, these grovens or basins would then fill with water and become lakes. Um, and also there were upland areas that were relatively dry some vegetated areas, but a lot of dry areas that had alluvial fans on them and had um, sediments basically streaming out of uplifted areas to form gravels, sands, alluvial fans, and other types of deposits that were forming at this time in a semi-arid or, or um, a, a seasonably, seasonably wet um, environment. So you'd have seasonal rains that would come through and rain, and then it would be dry for a lot of the times. So it was, it was a fairly tough environment. It was not a lush tropical um, situation. Um, there was a lot of dry land, a lot of bare rock, and the dinosaurs would have to congregate around oases, essentially. The lakes would have water in them. So it may have been dangerous for some of the herbivores to come down to the water because surely there were predators nearby watching out for them and able to stock them along the shores of the river. And there was vegetation. Uh, we had juniper-like trees called chirolepidaceans that left a lot of fossils in the rocks. And we also had um, Clothropterus and other really neat uh, looking uh, plants. There were cycads as well. Um, so there was a fair amount of vegetation, but the biodiversity was fairly low at this time. Why? because the earth had just come through two terrible mass extinctions, the end Permian mass extinction and the end Triassic mass extinction. So Podocosaurus lived in a world that had experienced a double whammy. It had been hit by two terrible mass extinctions. So um, the diversity of plants and animals was relatively low. And that makes the paleontology exciting because anytime you find something, it's likely to be rare, important, and something new. Awesome. That definitely sounds like a very interesting time on our planet here in Massachusetts. It was, it was an interesting time. <laughs> uh, you kind of hinted at it by saying that it was sort of past the two extinctions, but specifically, mm -hmm. uh, what period and maybe even time frame did mm -hmm. Podocosaurus live in? And that's a question from uh, era of age 10. Uh, okay. Uh, Podocosaurus lived approximately 200 million years ago. So uh, we're, we're at a time, we're, we're after the end Triassic uh, mass extinction, the Jurassic has started, the dinosaurs survived that extinction. They first appear in the middle Triassic and now they survived this mass extinction and they're, they're back. And, and it's a, a world that um, still has a lot of issues that probably the main reason for the mass extinction, um, it was, um, the volcanism that was associated with the breakup of the supercontinent. So um, uh, Podocosaurus would be hopping around boulders of lava, lava rock, that um, here in our area here, we would call it the Holyoke Basalt. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this Holyoke Basalt, which forms kind of a nice, dense looking pretty rock, was um, formed by a killer lava. The lava that formed in this eruption, a gigantic eruption called the Central 
Atlantic magmatic province put so many toxic gases, mercury and other things into the atmosphere that it killed much of the creatures on the planet. The dinosaurs were lucky to survive and Podocosaurus was one of the lucky survivors. That probably explains why Podocosaurus is pretty small. The survivors of mass extinctions are, are uh, influenced by what's called the Lilliput effect. And so they're like Lilliputians compared to the dinosaurs that came after. So it's no surprise that, that Podocosaurus was a fairly small dinosaur. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and now Caroline is wondering, what did it eat? Because you said there's not really a lot of biodiversity. Yeah, um, there's not that much biodiversity, but there were still things to eat. Again, we don't have the skull of uh, Podocosaurus. So we have to make some assumptions based on the rest of uh, the Podocosaurus poliokensis skeleton. It uh, is, seems to be a carnivore. It seems to be a carnivorous dinosaur. And this was a, uh, an interpretation, and I believe a correct interpretation that was first made by Minion Talbot herself in 1911 when she became the first woman to publish uh, a, a new dinosaur species in uh, the American Journal of Science in 1911. And she assumed from what she saw on the remaining skeletal pieces that this was a carnivorous dinosaur, a small carnivorous dinosaur. And I would agree with that interpretation. So next thing we need to do as paleontologists is find the rest of the Podocosaurus skeleton and find its head then we could say a little more, uh, with a little more specificity, what it was eating. Was it specializing in insects, which were around? Was it eating small, uh, uh, four-legged creatures, small tetrapods, uh, which were also around at this time? Uh, we would be able to tell a lot from the dentition or the teeth of uh, uh, a complete Podocosaurus skull, which we are still searching for. Awesome, very cool. Uh, and sort of maybe thinking about um, kind of how you're looking for all of these. We had a question that came in a little bit earlier. I'm trying to go mm -hmm. back up to it. Um, ah, yes. What tools do you use to study dinosaur bones? But also, how do you find the bones from Rowan age nine? <laughs> uh, great questions, Rowan. Uh, now, to, to find dinosaur bones, uh, it, it takes um, two things. One is persistence and the other is luck. So you have to have persistence, you have to keep looking, and then you have to have luck. You have to just happen to be in the right place at the right time. And Minion Talbot uh, was in the right place at the right time to find that dinosaur skeleton. And uh, Becca, could you put up the, pic the cartoon picture of Minion Talbot? Let's sure have a look thing. at her. Let's share okay. that screen. There she is, there, there's Minion Talbot at, standing next to a reconstruction of uh, Podocosaurus. Now you see that Podocosaurus has a long head here. That's kind of based off of using Coelophysis as a model, but we're really not sure was the Podocosaurus head that long? Probably it was, but we need to find the fossil to be certain. Now, so you need persistence and luck to find the fossils. However, if you can have luck, you can also have bad luck. Becca, can you show the, the picture of the uh, people on the rubble of the building? Yes, that's this one. There we go. This is a very sad picture because the specimen of Podocosaurus um, was um, housed in a building called the Williston Hall at Mount Holyoke College. And then there was a big fire in 1917 that destroyed both the building and the fossil. Very, very sad. Um, and here we see um, uh, Minion Talbot, you see her, she's on the left there, bending over, picking up a rock, searching through the rubble to try to find the fossil um, that had made her famous, but it was gone. It was destroyed in this terrible fire. It was terrible bad luck for Podocosaurus. So um, that has made it harder for us to find more specimens because we don't know what the rock looks like exactly. Um, and it's very helpful to know the exact matrix or the exact type of sandstone or shale that the fossils were in. And Becca knows this, that it's very important to have that um, information, but it was lost during the fire. 
However, just recently, we've been able to find some more bone material in its surrounding rock, which is helpful because it gives us a guide to find more of that kind of rock. And if you find the rock, you will find the bones, guaranteed. Very cool. Well, thank you for that. That was a great answer. Hopefully, maybe we have some friends who will go out and find some dinosaurs of their own. <laughs> yes, I, I, I'm expecting help here. So, uh, and if you, um, if you do find something that you think is a dinosaur and it's in bedrock, just leave it there. Don't try to break it out yourself. You want to call in a paleontologist um, to help. If you find something that looks interesting, but it's on a hand sample, just a piece of loose rock lying on the surface, sure, go ahead and pick that up and take it home. But do get it to someone who knows what they're talking about and see if you can get it identified. Yes, I've uh, I've broken my fair share of trilobite fossils trying to get them out. So I understand yes, that. Yes, there's an <laughs> art to doing that. There really is. Awesome. So um, we have some questions here kind of about maybe other dinosaurs and other uh, creatures that were around. One question uh, that people are curious about is the famous dinosaur, the T-Rex. Did that ever live in Massachusetts? Oh, that's, that's a wonderful question. Uh, did T-Rex ever live in Massachusetts? And uh, the short answer is no, because during the, the late Cretaceous, which was the time when T-Rex was alive about 70 million years ago, uh, North America was divided into two islands. There was a Western island called Laramidia, and there was an Eastern island, our island called Appalachia. T-Rex only lived in Laramidia. Apparently it could not swim the Western interior seaway and come over to our place. So T-Rex is only a Western United States dinosaur as far as we know. However, there was a big dinosaur um, here in, in uh, Appalachia, which would have included um, uh, Cretaceous, Massachusetts. We know very little about this dinosaur. We only have a single tooth. It's called Diplotomodon. And again, we have to do more digging to find the rest of the Diplotomodon, which I think would have been a rival to a Tyrannosaurid dinosaur, but we know so little about it. All we know is that it was a big carnivorous dinosaur from a single tooth that was found in, in a place called Mullica Hill, New Jersey in Lake Cretaceous Strata. So we know there were big, scary, T-Rex-like dinosaurs in our part of the world, but we haven't found their skeletons yet. Very cool. That's uh, That would be an interesting thing to find for sure. Yeah, eventually we're going to find it. Awesome. Uh, now let's see. Um, the Greeks age six has a great question here, and I don't know if we know the exact answer to it, but how many different kinds of dinosaurs have been found? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and um, in some ways, there are paleontologists who would disagree about the answer to that question. Um, at this point, there are hundreds of species of dinosaurs that have been described. Um, and and uh, some people say that there are too many described species of dinosaurs, that some of them should be combined into uh, already existing species. Um, so, so that is somewhat a controversial question. Nobody really knows exactly how many dinosaurs ever lived. And I'm referring here to the non-avian dinosaurs, the non-bird dinosaurs, but I'm sure that it was in the thousands, maybe tens of thousands. And we're gonna know more and more about them as we dig more and more of their skeletons out of the ground. Sure, we'll, we'll find many more dinosaurs. Yes, there's many more to be found. So um, in other words, paleontology is a growth industry. We need lots of work to find all those missing dinosaurs. Awesome. Now, ONH7 has a question uh, wondering if any dinosaurs, or I guess for that matter, maybe any sort of prehistoric reptiles may have lived in the oceans near Massachusetts. Oh, that's, that's a wonderful question. Another great question. Uh, I would say um, that there was a sea developing um, off the um, East Coast of Massachusetts. And, and in fact, the sea could have ended up in Western Massachusetts. Uh, um, and the, the big fault called the Rift 
that open that opened up to form the Connecticut Valley could have continued opening into the North Atlantic Ocean. But what in fact happened was the North Atlantic Ocean opened up um, to just to the east of Boston as Africa and Morocco pulled away during the breakup of the supercontinent Pangea. And as Africa moved away from Boston, uh, seawater began to fill the gap. And yes, there would have been lots of marine reptiles um, in, in those ocean waters. Uh, this would have include, included ichthyosaurs, uh, plesiosaurs, and then later on in the Cretaceous, that would certainly have been than these marine reptiles um, uh, uh, swimming right off of our coast. It's gonna be hard to find their fossils though, because the strata that were formed when they were alive are still underwater and buried deeply uh, off the coast of Boston. So it's gonna be very hard to get those fossils. Awesome, thank you. And it looks like we have time for maybe just one more question. I know we have a lot of questions and I'm sorry, I can't get to all of them, but actually many, many people have asked this, including Leah, age seven. Uh, she's asking us, what are our favorite dinosaurs? Oh, great question, Leah, age seven. And uh, well, my favorite dinosaur is Triceratops. So I have a special fondness for the Museum of, Sci Museum of Science and their display of Cliff, the complete a triceratops a skeleton. Uh, but um, it, there are so many great dinosaurs, it's really hard to choose one that, that is a favorite. I think lots of people might say T-Rex or, or some of the newer dinosaurs coming out of China. Um, the Therizinosaurs are really scary looking and would be a great uh, favorite dinosaur. So there are many dinosaurs to choose from. Um, it would be kind of fun to take a, a poll to find out uh, which is the most popular favorite dinosaur. Oh, I know. I bet it probably would be T-Rex or one of the, the long neck sauropod dinosaurs, maybe. Yeah, quite possibly, because they're, they're very popular as well and, and reach these humongous sizes that are just amazing. Absolutely. My favorite is uh, Spinosaurus, <laughs> mainly Spinosaurus because of the Spinosaurus is a fantastic choice. And it seems like with each passing year, the reconstruction of Spinosaurus changes as we get new information about that famous dinosaur. Exactly, I think that's my favorite part about it. It just keeps changing. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining us today and answering all of these amazing questions. I know I could keep asking all of them, but we are pretty much out of time. So I'm going to give you a chance to say your goodbyes too. Well, thank you, Becca. I really enjoyed uh, joining you for this session. Those were some great questions and I was happy to be able to answer them. Um, I, I would just say to, your, to our audience here uh, that uh, paleontology is a, a wonderful uh, uh, both vocation and avocation. Learn everything you can about dinosaurs. And if you want to go into paleontology, I recommend it because it's so interesting. There's so many fossils that remain to be found and described and just uh, uh, stay, uh, uh, keep your eyes open when you're looking at the ground and also watch news stories for new information that's going to be coming out about new um, Jurassic dinosaurs from Massachusetts. I agree. Great advice. Thank you very much. Now You're I'm welcome. going to uh, end our uh, show here by sharing my screen one final time. Um, and I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I'm uh, very glad that you joined us and asked such awesome questions. So I hope that you can check out any more virtual offerings that we have at mos.org slash mos at home. Um, if you enjoyed this program and are able and willing to support the museum, we would welcome any uh, support by visiting engaged.mos.org slash welcome. And finally, if you would like to learn a little bit more about any of the information about our Massachusetts state dinosaur and uh, any fun activities that might be on there, you can head out to statedino.org and you can see a 3D model of one of the fossils that we were uh, talking about today. So bye everyone. Thank you.